too long since I heard those two jams back to back. Welcome, everybody. It is my office hours. It's been a long time since we've been together, since I did the last one mid last year. Here we are in February now, 2023. A lot of things have happened since the last time we met up. We've had impact, new product announcements. We've had things going GA that we haven't had a chance to talk about. We're going to get to all that today. I have a special guest for us today. I am the infamous Joe Garcia, and I'm so glad to have everyone back. I see chat going off already. That's great. We'll get to everyone's questions in the second hour. So for this first hour, though, I want to uh, take a minute, take a look at some of the newer products that are out, uh, specifically on the secrets management side. We're going to focus on that today in this office hours, and then uh, in the next office hours that gets scheduled, we'll go ahead and dive into some of the newer identity stuff as well. So uh, a couple action-packed uh, office hours coming up already planned for uh, the next coming month. But first, I want to introduce... My special guest for the day, I always like to do this with somebody and never alone. <clears throat> this man is uh, is a really good friend of mine. Uh, we go back. Uh, we actually started a couple months uh, apart. We'll get into that in a minute. He is the new, newly promoted principal uh, solutions engineer for DevSecOps. <clears throat> my colleague, my friend, Darren Kahn. Welcome, Darren. How are you? Hi, everyone. I'm doing great. How are you, Jill? I'm doing great. I'm glad we could finally get you on one of these. I've been trying since I started these to get you to get on one of these, yeah. but you're a busy man, so it's hard to get you on. But uh, how are things in your world so far? Things are good, other than it being a little breezy out there today. It's supposed to be a nice, warm New England day, 53 degrees, but the breeze is making it a little worse. This is like beach weather for us. Yeah. Yeah, well, First and foremost, you know, congratulations on the Thank promotion you. to principal. Even chat is out there congratulating you. So Thank uh, you very much. All around a big deal being principal. I don't quite know what that means. I, I, I'm sure you're probably still trying to feel it out yourself a little bit. Yeah, uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together some way. We'll make this roll into something that we all want it to be. Yeah, definitely. So still still working on the DevSecOps side of the house, right? Um, still dealing with Conjure, the credential providers. And then what we're going to be talking about here in a couple of minutes today, Conjure Cloud and Secrets Hub too. So yeah. still still focusing on that. That's good. So Darren and I, for, for everyone out there, uh, Darren and I started in customer success uh, oh, just way back when. Apart. Yeah, I think I started in like February and then maybe you came in around maybe April or May or something like that. Yeah, something like that. So uh, I think it was closer to the October time frame because I remember, remember Halloween oh, being okay. like, oh, this is this is around the time I didn't frame. Realize it was that far apart. Did you yeah. did, so did you go to impact in 2016? I think that's the the real qualifier there when you started. No, I did not. Okay. 2017 was my first. So, yeah, probably towards the end of the year. I was that was my first if I had missed sales kickoff by a week when I started oh. in February um, and then was able to attend Impact in 2016. Um, but Darren and I, since we started so close to each other, uh, we've always been roommates, pre-pandemic roommates. We <laughs> can't right. really do it anymore, but, but we, would, we would always have to double up with somebody when we went to these events like Impact, sales kickoff, even conferences like Black Hat, RSA. And so Darren was my go-to roommate and stuff. So uh, we've developed a great relationship and hopefully, you know, uh, that can oh, like minds, a lot of like minds. Yeah. So, uh, typically, you know, when somebody starts a well back when we started, right. I, gosh, I, I can't believe we, we've been <laughs> back here in the day. Years. You're, you're, you're at like, I think six going on seven, right? Yeah. Something like that. I'm, I'm at seven as of this month, I believe. But I mean, I can't even believe we've been here for this long. When we started in customer success, it was a completely different animal. Um, and they would actually prefer to hire from customers. So did you come from a customer before you came to CyberArk? I actually did not come from a customer. I'm a, and, and what you're saying is absolutely true, right? It's a lot of people came to CyberArk from customer positions. But I'm the unique uh, person that um, did not come from a customer and actually interviewed with CyberArk twice. I, I stupidly turned them down the first time in like 20... When was it? It was like 2009. 
right for that first one right and uh no it didn't come from a customer just had a friend uh, who worked at cyberarch and said hey you know i think you'd be a great fit for this i was like all right i'll give it a shot why not you got me on the day that i'm willing to uh to give you a shot on this and that's that's the start of my cyber career so did you apply directly to a customer success position or was it one of those situations where you were just like your friend kind of had the ins and you're like i'll take uh, i'll try out for anything and it <laughs> just happened to be an open position I, it was for customer success because uh, he pitched me, you know, here's what we do. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Be on the other side for once and not just be the the vendor side and, and actually be uh, helping people accomplish some things. So that's pretty cool. That's what, what initially drove me. And then once you came to CyberArk, now you're in customer success. You're with me and we're doing our customer success thing, uh, which at times felt like we were just free technical support. <laughs> Tier um, three, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, you know, it, it, that's 2016. You started 2016. We start to get into 2017. And what happens as we're going into 2017? Because you weren't in customer success for very long, if I remember correctly. You kind of just used that as a launching point into, you know, other facets of the company. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, I was not in customer. I don't even think I made it a year in customer success and not for any issues with customer success itself. It was saw some things, uh, thinking about client first and the whole cares mentality, even, even back then it was, I would like to be part of new clients, new prospects. So they get used to my face, right? So sucks for right. them, used to my face, but it's just so they, they'd have a constant touch point a continuity from beginning to end uh and uh you know we got talking with upper management at the time I was like here's what i'd like to do i'd like to do this sort of thing uh, and they said you know it would probably be better for you to be an se to try to accomplish those things right so that's the the way that we wanted to uh accomplish that in so we moved from cs to SE uh, mm -hmm. so that I can then facilitate all that. And so 2017 was also another milestone in the, the grand scheme of CyberArk. I actually was, I had, I'd only lasted barely a year in customer success as well myself before I moved over to the SE org, but I was what we considered at the time a corporate SE uh, with Len No, who is our white hat hacker evangelist now, uh, who is actually in our chat saying, what's up, Darren? So uh, he's he's watching us right now on YouTube. Uh, but I was a corporate SE. He was my manager. And then we start to get rumblings in the corporate SEs of this new acquisition coming down the pipeline called Conjure. And so we were lucky enough to really start tinkering with Conjure because we had the time and the resources to do it, right? We weren't, we were just the back end for, for SCs trying to help them out. And so we were able to get our hands on it very early, uh, be able to, to try and figure it out and stuff like that. But you being an actual sales engineer in the field, you were the first field SC that actually got to not only get acquainted with Conjure, but then take it, bring it to market and start selling it. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved with that at being such a new SE? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So for in in my previous life, uh, I actually wasn't anything technical. I was a um, I was just a middle manager, right? Dealing with that stuff. I went from engineering technical role to middle management. But along the way, there was a, a pivotal turning point that my CTO kind of set me off on. And that was learning about automation. This was in the um, perspective of PowerShell. So I was huge into PowerShell. I really loved everything. Like everything was automated to me. Uh, I really did not uh, like having to do anything more than once, right? I'm sure we all have those experiences where I, I just don't want to clean up that server again, <laughs> right? Let me, just, yeah. let me just schedule a task to deal with that. Right. So PowerShell, opened my eyes to the world of automation and containers and, and all the rest. So when I came to CyberArk, uh, it really wasn't a focus on that. But then, like you mentioned, very shortly after, they were like, hey, we did this Conjure thing and we want to get into to DevOps. So I was like, yeah, me, me, please, please. Yeah. I want to awesome. go back to that. So that's how that, that whole endeavor started. That's cool. You know, PowerShell was actually my introduction as well. And I'm sure 
you know, a lot of people in chat that are watching this now, probably their introduction into, you know, the world of automation in general, it's just so easy to pick up and learn when, you know, you're already on a Windows laptop, right? Most, most yeah. organizations have Windows laptops and PowerShell is just there for you and, and you have something that you need. Uh, easy to just start uh, uh, figuring out. And then that just creates this this it whole snowballs. like wanting to learn to continue going. I really liked PowerShell, the commandlets and the structure. Like once it started, because, you know, I, I, I've i been an engineer. I, I love making stuff. I love doing yeah. all that stuff. Uh, so once I started getting into the weeds, everything just made sense. And I yeah. liked it. And I was in my warm, happy place. Every yeah. time I, I would create a new function or, or string together something, I just seeing the results was all, also cool. And this was right around the time where my previous employer was, um, they were transitioning clients to Office 365, right? And, and yeah. that is PowerShell heavy. Everything you want to do, it's, you could go to the UI at the time, but might as well run a PowerShell script and do right. it for you, right? So that was huge uh, in that vein. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a very sane way of of approaching you know and, and kind of moving your way towards that uh, development and automation if you're insane like rob cobbins is uh watching on youtube he hates powershell and starts in c so <laughs> he, he kind of did it backwards he's like i'm gonna start with c and then make it easier from there so he goes for the hardest language but uh good you to know, see a couple of my a couple of my college buddies so we this is just a, a simple uh, you know, tangent on how important college professors are mm -hmm. to figure out what you like. We all took a C course in college. We had to. I was a, a computer engineering major. We all hated it because we could not solve any of the problems the professor gave to us. He wasn't very great at really teaching us any concepts or anything. So we all swore off any kind of coding whatsoever. <laughs> we were just all about like, forget it. Give me the UI, go to Windows, I'll do uh, IT admin stuff. Yeah. I don't need to do any of the software engineering. Um, but now after that PowerShell said, I was like, man, my career trajectory would have been far different had I had a different experience all the way back then. So anyone who starts with C, power to you if you can if you definitely if you can understand all that. I definitely need a little bit more hand holding. See, I, I I didn't have that experience in college. I I they actually taught us Python, surprisingly. Really? Yeah, so they they taught us uh, uh, how to logically plan using a, an old application called Raptor. You know, logically plan our our uh, uh, what we were going to develop, and then we used Python in a very basic form. Um, and this was like two thousand, gosh, six, two thousand seven. Uh, back when I was getting ripped off by ITT Tech, <laughs> got, that, got that payout, got my loans forgiven, so all of that money is is taken care of. Thanks, uh, thanks, Grandpa Joe. Um, but, but, you know, uh, the, <laughs> I took a C course, and then they had me designing the logic flow in assembly. Right? Oh wow! Because oh, computer wow. engineering is a lot about, uh, and I took some I would have chemistry courses and stuff. Yeah, so it wasn't the best coding experience yeah. uh, that I could have had, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, that's it, it's good that we have you here. You know, you've been with Conjure now for six out of the seven years you've been employed with us, you know, same, same yeah. as me. Um, you know, I did deviate here and there and stuff, which you did not. You you stuck through. There were there were some times where you know it was very hard trying to bring our community up on board with Conjure and, and get them to speak the same language we were trying to speak to them, that their developers were speaking. You know, I took some time away from the SE org to try and build on that through the blueprint for identity success and the PaaS programs office from the customer success side. But you stuck through it, man. And uh, here you are, principal. SE for DevSecOps, <laughs> the one, the only. Uh, right. you know, I'm just a mere senior here, and I, I'm pretty sure I just got that title because I've got so much gray hair in my beard now compared to when I started, you know? I'm catching up. I'll catch up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's Conjure or the, or the two kids, one of, one, of the, one of those two things. So something we like to do on these office hours is to share what T-shirts we're wearing. And I see that you have a, it looks like a zip-up uh, uh, sweater, yeah. not a hoodie, but a zip-up sweater yeah, with a side work look. But what shirt are you wearing underneath? It looks so, to me like I may, I may recognize it right you now. You may recognize it. It's, it's the uh, CyberArk Tech Jam 
That's sure. right. You can't see that. Stand up. Stand up. Are you standing? No. no. Oh my no. gosh. Are you sitting? I was sitting. Yes, yes. The cyber arc. That was one of my. What, was it? what year was this again? Uh, that was that was the the impact before the pandemic. So 2019 yeah. impact. We did uh, we did a partner event. So if you're a partner of of CyberArk, uh, the SCs held a a partner event where the SCs coupled with a bunch of partners and we did uh, basically like capture the flags. So, like we had different yeah. stations set up in an in an event hall uh, with different capture the flag challenges, and we would go from station to station with our group and. Uh, and try to solve the challenges. It was a lot of fun. That t-shirt is one of my favorite t-shirts that we've ever designed. Um, although I am, I'm very happy to is see the, one of the orange ones and not the ones that turned out brown. So I was going to say, if you got the, uh, the rare brown version, I do have one. It is upstairs in my dresser, right? So that's one of the, the old cyborg trivia you can have, you can say, you know, do you, do you have the, the off print? Yeah, jam shirt. <laughs> there was there was some off printing happening. Um, so, you know, Acer One asked if it, if that was the the first one of those, and it, it was. It was unfortunately also the only well, the last yeah. so far of those. Um, definitely, a lot of great feedback came from that event, and it's something that we want to do again. Of course, uh, Last Impact, which you know we'll talk about here in a little bit as we start to dive into Conjure Cloud and Secrets Hub and taking a look at those solutions. Impact this year, or sorry, in 2022, last year was the first impact uh, uh, that we've had in person again. So uh, it was definitely. Uh, feeler for us. We didn't feel that it was going to be well attended, even though it ended up being very well attended and, and kind of blew out our expectations. So yeah, it was crazy. Um, I, you know, uh, I hope that maybe next uh, this this upcoming impact we we bring it back. If not, then sometime in the near future. Because uh, oh man, it was so much fun. I, I I just had maybe even if it's like a little mini event that goes around with you know how they like to do the impact live series or whatever after the the legit impact and maybe i don't know we'll see um but definitely has my vote to come back and and it sounds yeah like it was one of the, the very nice segments that we put on there was a lot of positive feedback for that particular thing yeah so i want to um Let's talk a little bit about a couple of the new products and secrets management that uh, you and I have been dealing with now for over six months. But uh, our customers and our community out there may not be too aware of. And, and that is both Conjure Cloud and Secrets Hub. I want to start first with Conjure Cloud, and then we can talk about Secrets Hub afterwards because Conjure Cloud is... it. it I, I, I feel like people should uh, should be comfortable with it, uh, already having a basic understanding of self-hosted Conjure Secrets Manager. Uh, but there are some stark differences between the two, right? Uh, yeah. that, that we should probably touch on. And I think starting there, we can we we can take a look at Conjure Cloud. I'm going to kind of let you. Uh, uh, if I, we we tried to dry run this yesterday, and I never got your presentation through. I don't know if you can present your screen. I can try and see if if it comes across. But uh, you know, we'll have you yeah. kind of drive for Conjure Cloud. Um, but but really, you know, trying to explain the differences between how things are done in self hosted compared to Conjure Cloud. You know, with the authentication and the way that the the shared services work and stuff like that, I think would be cool to to kind of touch on. Um, and then we can talk about Secrets Hub a little bit, um, and I can drive that if 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 you want or I'm if sure we can, can tag team it. Yeah, we know a lot about both. So the the big thing with both of those actually is what you mentioned the shared services, right? So <laughs> what does that mean? Before we dive into either one of them, what what does that do for you? What does that mean for CyberArk and all that? Uh, it really just means that there can now be information exchange between these different products, right? So you can do things like advanced auditing. So you know exactly where everything is going and you don't have to wonder that this component work with that, that this component work with that. They're all coming from the same shared platform. So you can have all these different services coupled together and then sharing that, that common fabric underneath. Audit's the big one that we like uh, to, to showcase because we're all security people. We love that security stuff, right? So 
we want to make sure that you have a good vision of all of those things. And then we just layer on services on top, right? So getting into Conjure Cloud specifically, it's Conjure, right? That's It's a way to pull back secrets uh, from anywhere, as long as you can authenticate and all that. Perfect. It's a great slide for it. That's that yeah, right here. platform. Down yeah. here at the bottom, shared services. So kind of gives you a little outlook of it. Yeah, and we're only expanding upon that, right? Um, to make sure that everything communicates, because that's what everyone kind of expects. That's the way that we want all these services to run uh, in the first place. Mm -hmm. All right, so, and everything's built to top of that. So Conjure Cloud. Let's get right out of the bat. What are the differences? You don't have as many, um, you don't have any components to worry about. The big thing with a SaaS offering, there's no hardware you have to worry about, right? But it still functions the same from your code and security perspective. Right. So you still get all of the authentication mechanisms. You still get the ability to run this thing or make calls from Azure, AWS, on-prem, wherever you want. You still get to use, uh, coming later, uh, different um, local caches right? Uh, that can be utilized, much like Conjure followers are today, in, in various places. Right, There's going to be all those options available to you. Uh, and it's going to make it so that you can just transition code that you want effectively over to, you know, Conjure Cloud and be able to make those calls as well. And so as far as like as as far as Conjure Cloud is concerned, that I believe is GA right now. Am I correct in that thinking? So we have a interesting release cycle is the only way I can I can put that uh, at this point. So we are we are moving more towards a um, MVP, a minimum viable product release cadence. So instead of looking at holistically Conjure Cloud or we have one new feature, let's release a whole new version, we are streamlining that so that as new features become viable and become ready for use, we're going to get those out there. So the traditional milestones of you know, controlled availability and general, uh, general availability yeah, uh, don't apply as much. So right now, Conjure Cloud is controlled availability as a whole. Uh, but certain aspects of the feature set can either be a milestone before or even a milestone after. It all depends on what specific feature there are. But they have said that for all intents and purposes, it's controlled availability. And the very next thing would be general availability. And then as far as for Secrets Hub, I, I do believe that is still controlled availability. Um, there's a couple more features we want to deliver before we move that to general availability. Um, but isn't that expected to go GA? I, I know at least this half of the year, right? Before before the the end of this half. But do you remember? I, I, I don't even want to get any 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 closer than that. PM will kill me. I, I believe that's what we're targeting, right? And you know, I've been using Conjure Cloud and Secrets Hub for. <laughs> What, months now, right? You same with you. And yep. um, the things that I believe they're really trying to button up now are, isn't so much the the nitty gritty technical aspects. It's more documentation. Make sure everyone's got support. Every uh, internally, all of the organizations understand when things are happening, how they're happening, and all that. Mm -hmm. It's it's really the the finite crossing the uh, T's and dotting the I's at this point. Not so much uh, any any code, right? A major code being implemented. I just realized I I forgot an arrow here. Did you? I, I forgot an arrow coming from here to to there. Well, that's right. Yeah. Oh, good All thing. All of I... it coming from privileged cloud, right? The, yeah. That piece. There will be some. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say for that privileged cloud. So uh, the question we always get, or at least I always get, is. Well, I don't have privileged cloud. What about you know on-prem support? Those are all things that are being worked on uh, as well yeah. uh, for Secrets Hub. Um, right now, not on the roadmap for Conjure Cloud, but you know, never know. People start complaining a little bit more, and, and oh, roadmaps thanks. change. Uh, yeah. So one of the biggest differences uh, regarding Conjure Cloud um, is also the way it handles uh, synchronizing secrets from. Uh, the vault, right? Can you explain yeah. to me a little bit about that? Because if 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 I were to switch slides here, I can kind of set it up for you a little bit. We've got shared services here with Privilege Cloud that is is probably, um, you know, well, it's not probably. I know it is the the way that we synchronize secrets to Conjure Cloud. But when I switch over to my self hosted Pam here, I I only have the self hosted Secrets Manager 
in the Conjure Vault synchronizer here, but no Conjure Cloud. Can you can you kind of go into that? Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's go with where we are now with the synchronizer and what are and how that works, right? So the synchronizer uh, is an interval based solution. It pulls the self holds hosted vault that's user definable, but the default is five minutes, uh, and it will pick up any changes and send it over to the Conjure main instance. We could just think of that as a Conjure black box at this point. And, you know, it does things after that. Uh, so it's it's simple in its nature because it accomplishes one goal and, and simple is good when it comes to a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to be able to, to minimize the time it takes to go from that vault to Conjure because a lot of times things happen really, really fast, right? So that's the synchronizer. Now let's move over to Conjure Cloud. You may think it's just a synchronizer running in the background, but it actually isn't. It's something that's been completely rebuilt. They call it a replicator. Um, and unfortunately, right now, it does not work with an on-premise vault, right? It's designed specifically to work with um, a privileged cloud vault, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we're, we'll take all of that in consideration. This product is still CA, so PM is still very interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on use cases, how they're going to use it, what they want to use it for, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what Privileged Cloud has is the replicator. Ultimately, it accomplishes the same thing. However, the key difference is that interval, that polling interval the synchronizer uses. That is not there in uh, in the replicator in Conjure Cloud. Because of that shared services platform, we can know a little bit more about what's going on with those accounts when they when they are rotated, how they're rotated, all that kind of stuff, so that we can be a little bit more adept at, oh, there's a change now. Let's go ahead and, and pull that into Conjure Cloud instead of waiting and just seeing if something has changed on that five-minute interval. Right. So it's a lot more streamlined and attuned to what is actually going on in the um, privileged cloud vault. Awesome, cool. So that's that covers synchronization. Um, what about authentication? Like, let's say I have, um, I, you know, I'm sure the the authenticators are still there and available in Conjure Cloud, the same that they are for the self-hosted Conjure Secrets Manager. But what about me as a user? Can you kind of go into some of the? Maybe this is the point where you share your screen. Yep. And and that way we can visualize it because I know the first time it was explained to me, it was like whoosh, right over my head. <laughs> until yeah, I actually yep. saw it working in action. So I'll I'll go ahead and I'll remove my my slides from oh, there, my the screen, screen and we'll yeah. get your computer queued up over here. Um, and while that's happening, uh, we did have a couple questions. Um, Adam Chandler on YouTube asked when attack and defend is and. Uh, that's a great question that either Andy Thompson or or Hacker213, let know in uh, the YouTube chat as well, can can help to answer for you, provide you links to any upcoming events for that. Uh, and then also, we got another question a little while ago from Avi, uh, how to learn REST APIs for privileged cloud easily. And really, it's not <clears throat> a matter of uh, how to learn the REST APIs for privileged cloud compared to self-hosted. They're going to both be the same. It's just a matter of how you deal with the authentication. And I've gotten this question a lot. And so I feel like we're going to do an out-of-band office hours where I cover Postman, how to use it, uh, in, you know, dealing with our self-hosted and privileged cloud REST APIs, what the differences look like there and the authentication and stuff like that. It really warrants its own conversation where you know customers can ask their questions related to just that because so many changes are happening there now. So I just wanted to get these two out of the way while we were waiting for your computer to catch up to us, and it seems like it did. Uh, yeah. So here we are. So go ahead and, and I'll uh, I'll let you let you roll. Yeah, absolutely. So you know we can actually cover some of that identity question. You know, where are these users, where do these all all these things come from? Uh, if they're not in the individual point solutions, they all come from Cyberarch Identity, right? We talked about that shared platform. Well, Identity is the IDP, as the name implies, identity uh, for these solutions. So when you need to get access to something, you can go into Identity and you can 
grant that access to those particular users for whatever they want. As you see here, I have very specific access. I have uh, a couple of the different cyber products, Contra Cloud, one of them, Secrets Hub, Cloud Entitlements Manager, right? And these are all based upon that identity, but that's how I'm gonna get into Contra Cloud, or that's one of the ways that I can see information from Contra Cloud is by getting that identity. And that is one of the key differentiators between the on-premise version of Conjure and Conjure Cloud. Because of that shared platform, like I mentioned, CyberArk Identity gives you the ability to, to span all the products instead of just remembering, oh, <clears throat> what was my Conjure Cloud username? Oh, it was this. Okay, that's how I used to log in. Nope, it's one single identity to get you into all the different solutions. And so this, is the, this is the shared services that you keep referencing uh, uh, that the Conjure Cloud SaaS services built off of where we can basically jump in the same UI to any of these different uh, services that are available. Yeah. And, you know, because we like to tinker so <laughs> darn much and Joe's in the same environment that I have, uh, they've limited our access to just these ones. There's a whole bunch of other ones that um, I'll probably get in far more trouble for trying to <laughs> manipulate and, and configure than, than I probably should, right, for tinkering. So this is what we got. And this is this is the user interface for Conjure Cloud, which is going to be another de another departure from the on-premise version, right? We have that fancy web UI that you can go mm -hmm. see information. What we've done is taken some of the feedback that we've gotten from that uh, web UI, right? Some people say it's highly useful in these areas, but maybe not so much in these other areas. We've taken all that and said, all right, let's move that into the uh, the web UI that you normally go to for all the CyberArk stuff. So if I need to bounce between Privilege Cloud and Conjure, uh, Conjure Cloud, I can do that all from one pane of glass. But let me take some of that information about, well, what are the resources within um, Conjure, right? What are the secrets that are there? Or what is the usage like, right? This is a big one that was recently added. Well, give me a snapshot of all the stuff that's in Conjure Cloud. I don't necessarily want to run a report or don't want to log into Splunk or a Sim tool. What what can I how can I figure out what is in Conjure Cloud? And here we go, right? Here's all the things we can figure out uh, about what's in there, and we're expanding upon this all the time. But if you notice, there isn't a whole heck of a lot you can do with the UI, right? You can see some information, see you know various various audit information and things like that. Well, but we really well. Go ahead. To be fair, self-hosted Conjure Secrets Manager that user interface. Not much you can do there either, except for just That's like true. read the resources. And then in this case, you can, it looks like you can copy the secret value or copy the ID. Um, you can set a variable, right? A secret variable in the self hosted Conjure UI. Uh, but to copy that ID, I end up getting trailing spaces. Do you ever have that happen to you where oh, there's like all these trailing? And then you're like, oh my gosh, this whole entire POC, I've been troubleshooting <laughs> a trailing space on the ID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and even feedback like that, right? From mm -hmm. a developer perspective, how can we make their life easier? That's why we have things like, oh, I can just copy the ID now because I can't. Some yeah. of the IDs can get pretty long, right? They, <laughs> we've all had like fourteen, you know, forward slashes. There's spaces in there, and you're like, oh, how am I going to character escape all these different things? Yeah. You know what? Let me just copy it. So much easier. And the other nice thing is, sample. What? Set, I haven't right? seen this yet. This is new to me. Go to go. You, you don't show the Java, you show the Go. <laughs> show the Go. You're going to be able to change that, swap it. Who uses Java, right? Right. Yeah. So Put this is first. nice. I can now see examples of fetching that specific secret, right? How am I going to get that? What is it going to do? It's still, I, it doesn't go through all the authentication mechanisms because it's still going to look for this API key, but it's a good way to get started, right, from what's there. That's really cool because if you scroll up to the imports up at the top, we're importing in the the Conjure uh, Go client library for the API. And so we're oh, yeah. giving you a, an example of basically how to do what it is you need to do using that client library. So it's not even like the raw form where you're you're having to build all this stuff into. We're we're using, we're we're providing you examples based off of um uh, well, like I'm guessing the client library for Java would be used for Java. And then if you really wanted to see like the raw. Yeah calls happening that would be curl right yeah yeah Here which is go. probably the easy the easiest to digest for many right that's out there yeah. uh, but yeah something also to keep in mind is that this 
it's not just um, a static sample code tempo. Like I mentioned, mm -hmm. it it actually has the specific things you're trying to find. It's it sweet. actually populates the URL. You, yeah. so you don't even have to think that much about, oh, what is all my conjure information? It it fills it in for you, all these, all these things right. that you're going to need to know. So that's what I mean by we're trying to listen to the feedback. We really are. I know some people think, you know, um, it goes in here, one out the other. We are really trying to stick to the feedback we're getting from all yeah. walks of life, right? All different personas. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of nice things coming down for Conjure Cloud on the roadmap. Right, to be able to perform some extra functionality when you want it to be there, right? In case you want uh, local caches and things like that. Not things that are available today, uh, but they're things that we hope to get out there in uh, in short order. Right? So what are some other ways outside of the UI that you can interact with Conjure Cloud? Um, obviously, there's an API because we're looking at some example code here for the API, but um, is there like a CLI available and, and, and how does that maybe work when it's not being used by, you know, unattended automation through like bash scripts and things like that? Like I'm a human, you can you kind of give us an example of what that looks like? Right, right. So there is a CLI and I believe there's a link to it down here, right here, Conjure CLI. Uh, we actually have, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, we have like three CLIs at this point. But uh, if are you using one, mine? because that's a, oh, that's, that's right. Well, there's, there's, there's four, there's one really good one. And they, then there's three I, other ones I that are available. It. Cyber CLI covers appreciate it. all if you don't know what, what he's talking about. You can go to my GitHub and you can find it very easily. <laughs> yeah, that's the place to go. Shameless plug. That's not, that's not so shameless because we all, we all use it internally, right? So there's no no issues there. Uh, there's an official Conjure CLI one. If anyone's using the old uh, old Docker container CLI, uh, get rid of that. <laughs> Just don't bother with that one at all. It still may function, but there are new endpoints or new things that it just does not uh, do. And we want to try to actively, I believe we did deprecate that. I'll have to double check that later, but I'm pretty sure we did. Um, either sorry. way, just just use Cyber CLI and your life will be so much easier. Yeah. Uh, to well, get in there. Yeah, working on the 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 Conjure Cloud user authentication support. So, so basically, you know, as from a user's perspective, you know, it, since this is SaaS based, it's using shared services. Uh, if you click on your little, I don't know, what do we want to call that? A honeycomb or a waffle or this thing? I think they call it the picker. I don't know if that's the picker. official word for this. Yeah. If you told me go click the picker, I would have never guessed it would have been <laughs> that. It looks like um, I don't even I don't even know what it looked honestly. Like I'm so used to seeing a hamburger. Remember the hamburger where it was the yes. three lines, and then you would click that. That and... was in the that was the name of it in the Android design document. Yeah, where and, and I looked at it, I'm sure they have one. For, not, it must be a name for this. What what I would love to see, honestly, since you know um, we're 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 picking on the picker a little bit here. <laughs> I, 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 I like, you know, the real estate that I get, um, you know, by having all of these services tucked away. But at the same time, if you take a look at like the introduction and the resources and the usage pages and you keep an eye on the upper portion of the screen where your name is, you'll never see any content go above your name. Uh, that resources title, that usage title, all of that does. But you could literally turn that into a horizontal bar and have icons for the services lined across the top in a top nav fashion. And that way, it's a little bit more prevalent. Uh, you know, it, 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 instead of you know needing to click and jump and then you know new windows open and it gets kind of confusing and stuff like that. But you know. Um, there are reasons for everything, and uh, it, it it just takes a little getting used to to look for. I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it the waffle. It looks like a. It looks. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm. I'm in Tampa, so we got Waffle House. It kind of looks like a Belgian <laughs> waffle to me. So I'm gonna stick with waffle. Well, we don't have a picker house, at least not that I know of in New England. But it, that that's just what I heard a colleague say. Picker. I'm like, all right, I I can sort of see that. I can I can do that. I mean, waffle just gets me hungry. Now, can you can you can you help me and and actually help Acer as well uh, with with. You know how the development if you have any insights to it i know you're not product management so you, you you can only go so far with with this but 
uh, how is the development between the self-hosted and the the Conjure Cloud solutions kind of being handled there? Are they separated? Are they like, is, is the cloud being used to then bring to on-prem or is there anything you can share regarding that? Yep, actually. So the same upstream project is responsible for both of them, right? So Conjure Open Source is powering, uh, or at least parts of it, right, uh, as the upstream project will eventually make it into both Conjure Cloud and Conjure Enterprise. Where the features make sense to have parity, they will. Obviously, there are some limitations with that. One, the shared services platform, right? If we develop something in Conjure Cloud that utilizes identity and um, flows or anything else, right? going to be kind of hard to port that back into Conjure Enterprise. But as far as things like authentications, integrations with third-party applications, we want to keep that in uh, lockstep as much as possible. At least that's the stated goal. Uh, and one of the, the key things you, you can look for to make sure we're keeping good on that is that all the same API endpoints that are available in Conjure Cloud are available in Conjure Enterprise, right? So one of the, the key entry point for a lot of those integrations is going to be that API. And right now we're keeping them the same, right? They're pulled from the same source. So there should not be much of a divergence, if at all, between the two. Cool. Yeah. So that that's, I think, the important point to note there is that, you know, there's no changes to the integrations or the applications functionality with either self-hosted Conjure or Conjure Cloud. Um, the real changes come from the added bonus that we get from relying on a shared services now. You know, we're no longer needing to deal with differing customer environments that could be hosting a synchronizer service where there's different latency involved and everything needs to be interval based so that we can keep uh, things pretty consistent from our end. You know, we can now start to build in event triggers and, and, and things like that that uh, were very hard to do before. So very, very cool. Thank you for covering. Con well, you're already here. Do you want to switch over to Secrets Hub and we can talk a little bit about Secrets Hub? Um, I did Absolutely. share. The cool thing about Secrets Hub is that uh, you can see here um, that I have, uh, I have it, you know, on my privileged cloud solution architecture, but I also have it on my self-hosted uh, cloud solution architecture as well. And then uh, this really is, is I believe, the main hang up with this going generally available right now. We really want that self-hosted PAM synchronization in place for Secrets Hub to be able to, to handle things. Um, but if you, if you could, Darren, could you just get into a little bit uh, around the just high level interaction and then we can take a look a little bit deeper at like, you know, how it gets set up with uh, AWS Secrets Manager, which is our current supported uh, cloud service provider store. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So the key question, what is, what is Secrets Hub? What is it, it doing, right, um, at a high level? And, and it's so simple, right? It is, I want to take stuff. That's in my Cyborg vault. I want to put it in AWS Secrets Manager, and I want to make sure whatever I synchronize over there is in lockstep with any changes or updates or modifications made to that item in the Cyborg vault. All right, at its core, that is it. I want to, to get the ability to rotate credentials, make sure they're up to date, and I want to synchronize them in near real time over to AWS Secrets Manager. Okay, cool. Let's. Uh, I'm going to switch over to your screen then, and then uh, we can take a take a look at how it how easy it is to set up. So, just before we get into it with you, I I just want everyone to know that I we did a webinar on this last year. You remember that webinar? Yep. And it was basically, you know, hey guys, we need like seven to ten minute videos on Conjure Cloud and Secrets Hub because it's post-impact and we want to do a CyberArk webinar on this, but we don't want the videos and the demonstrations to take up too long uh, of a time. And the, I think you hit, what, what, like maybe 12 minutes for Conjure Cloud? I think you kind of went over the 10-minute mark slightly. But I was able to take Secrets Hub from zero to hero, to use that old cliche, in seven minutes in a, in a video for this demonstration. So that's how easy it is to get up and running from scratch with this. So just go go through kind of the setup and, and I think people will start to understand, you know, why 
uh, we love doing these POCs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and to provide some color to that, I remember that webinar now. I think yeah. that there was um, a bit oh. of a a bit of a, a natural a natu weather related incident you had during yeah. that time. Yeah, two um, minutes to show time, and my phone starts going off that there's a tornado down the road, and I had to go run and hide in my closet for the webinar. <laughs> yeah. uh, but as far as the demo portion, the thing that really stuck out to me was, was we really did see how long it would take, as you said, from zero to hero in both of these. And that means fresh install, mm -hmm. like you, you've just been provisioned the service, how long before an app is making use of it? Not just how long did you configure it or did you get a secret there? How long till an application is using this? And you're right. I was around we're around the 10 minute mark because uh, I had to take some extra screenshots. Uh, it slowed me down. Uh, and you were right around the seven to eight minute mark. And that's that means that, you know, from the time you could see value or the time you can utilize this thing to make a meaningful impact on your applications was less than the time it takes well, me to just go get a snack, really, uh, for any of this stuff. So it's, it's super simple because we're doing a lot of that. So what are we looking at here? We know that it ends up in AWS. How does it get to AWS? It's called the target, right? We're gonna keep things super simple. Um, you know, I, I would get brought into 60 minute meetings to talk about uh, Secrets Hub all the time. And I'm like, all right, what are we gonna do for the other 15 minutes? Because it really <laughs> does do exactly what you think it's gonna do. Yep. We do give you some flexibility and options there though, because we understand you can't just dump everything in AWS Secrets Manager. There has to be some level of, of flexibility there. And that all starts with a sync target. So a sync target really just says, where am I going in AWS? If you even stop to think about all the things you would need just to, to synchronize something to AWS, you probably have already picked all the pieces that we're going to go through here, right? It's where am I going? What's the account that I'm going to? What region within that account do I want to shove secrets into, right? So you can break it down by all the different regions out there. And that's it, right? That's the all really the only things you need to define for a sync target. The thing that a lot of people pick up on is the Secrets Hub IAM role. What is that? Well, if we stop to think about it for a second, we're doing something in our Secrets Hub tenant, which is running on AWS, and it needs access to your account. So we will give you an IAM role that will give us some least privilege to um, perform CRUD operations, right? Create, read, update, uh, delete on secrets within that region. We'll give you that as a starting off point. You don't have to have one for every single region and every single account. You could if you wanted to, uh, but it's up to you. As long as we have the basic uh, commands, uh, ability to perform those CRUD operations, we're completely fine, right? So that's how we're going to get access. We're going to assume uh, an IAM role that has access to those secrets, and then we're going to perform all of our stuff, right? So that's a target. That's all you need for the target. And then if we stop and think about, well, what else do we need? We, we know where we're going to go. Now we need to figure out what is going to go over there. And that's where we come into these sync policies. And this suit really is what's safe, when it's populated here in a second, do I want to send over to what sync targets? So I'll use I'll use my own. This is a shared environment as much as I like to mess with everyone else's stuff. I'll use my own dev database. And we yeah. say, I want to take all the contents of that dev database. I want to shove it into the target for DK dev environment, right? And that's it. I won't actually create this one because I don't want those secrets going there, not yet anyway. Uh, but that's that's all you have to do um, to get that those safe contents into uh, a specific AWS secrets manager region. Just as simple as that. Yeah, and the, the, the part that I liked about this when, when I was first uh, uh, experiencing it was if you go back to the targets um, and you create a, a, a target, the very first step that we didn't really talk about is creating that Secrets Hub IAM role up at the top. And when you follow that link, I don't know that it'll show on your screen or not because I think it looks like you're kind of just displaying your window. Oh, there we go. I'll, I'll, I'll switch the tabs. It we, you, we give you the CloudFormation JSON template for you to copy pasta into CloudFormation and run. There's no changes that need to be made to this. Like you don't even need to think. You're just copy, paste, run CloudFormation. It creates the role, uh, and and all the all all the roles policy really allows it to do is take CRUD actions on the Secrets Manager in AWS. So what? Create, read, update, delete, and then also to create and remove tags because we yeah. use a tagging system in order to identify 
what secrets in AWS Secrets Manager are being managed by CyberArk through Secrets Hub. And then, you know, if it doesn't contain those tags, we know that it's a secret that a developer or someone else just ad hoc added into that Secrets Manager. And even towards the bottom of this, there's an additional optional policy that you can load up that basically allows your developers to continue to use AWS Secrets Manager for their own secrets as they see fit and allows us to apply deny permissions to the ones that are tagged as being managed by CyberArk so that they can't delete them, they can't update them, they, they can't interact with them at all. It's completely owned by Secrets Hub and the role it's assuming. And that way the developers can continue to use AWS Secrets Manager to store their own secrets without interfering with what we're trying to manage and provide to AWS Secrets Manager from Secrets Hub. You know, and it's, some people also say that it's unusual for us to, to put this side kind of thing in our documentation because it's not directly a CyberArk product. This is where we take off the product hat and say, look, we're trying to make things as secure as possible. So we don't need to go and do this, right? But we're right. thinking, we definitely don't want someone to modify that, right? So let's give people um, a baseline that they could yeah. use to then say, I'm going to make you that much more secure. And so this is this is available today. It's controlled availability. Secrets Hub as a whole is controlled availability. But I mean, we've been doing this with AWS Secrets Manager since Impact last year. So July right. last year. This is a pretty well fleshed out process that um, has gone through. I mean, we've both done POCs on it with customers. We've both been, you know, basically doing a Secrets Hub roadshow for the most part and, and talking to a lot of people about it. Uh, but I think you'll agree with me that the number one question that I get, and, and probably you get too, is, hey, guys, great to see you support AWS, but what about Azure Key Vault? So the one time that we go a route we think is going to be more popular, it turns out that it's the other cloud service provider that we get questioned about all the time. So any news you can bring us as far as Azure Key Vault integration with Secrets Hub? Yeah, they're currently working on it to bring all this goodness over to Azure Key Vault. I don't think there's an official timeline for it yet, but I will. I do know specifically it is currently being worked on um, by a lot of developers, right? So it's something we want to get out there as soon as possible. That's good. I, I believe that there is actually a design partner program that we are fleshing out people to join. So obviously you can't just say in chat here, hey, I want to do it. Like, it, it, <laughs> I mean, you could. It won't, it won't do any good. <laughs> it, 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 it's something that obviously, you know, you would need to go to, you know, your account manager with CyberArk to, to bring up with them that, hey, we have a pretty huge Azure Key Vault use case where we'd like CyberArk to meet us there instead of needing to move our secrets around. Product management would then be invited onto a call with you to get a little bit more information about your use cases and make sure it's a good fit. So, there are some hoops to jump through to get accepted into that design partner program, but it is one that we are looking for uh, customers, preferably with, that are utilizing Azure Key Vault in a large scale, right? So we can get a yeah. good uh, data set of, of information regarding the scalability uh, from an enterprise perspective of what we're trying to do. Um, but definitely inquire with you know your 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 account executives, uh, your 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 customer success managers, your you know solutions engineers or, or solutions architects, whoever it is that you guys lean on about that program, and we can uh, get you hooked up. We need some we need a few good people for for trying out the Azure Key Vault stuff, so we can make it as successful as we are uh, with yeah. AWS Secrets Manager today. So, and just to close the loop on Secrets Hub, right? Let me show you what it looks like in Secrets Manager, right? It's 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 pretty much everything you expect it to be, but we do add some things. Uh, Joe did mention, hey, we need permissions to tags. That's because when we bring them on board, we've set up a whole bunch of tags so that you know where this came from, what's the safe, what's the platform, all that, that kind of stuff, along with the secret value and things. And it comes on, over in a very specific manner. Here's the safe. Here's the account name or the object name, right? That's going to be put out there yeah. uh, for this. So you can get a good sense of how everything's going to look uh, when you go to pick up that secret. And then uh, if you were to retrieve the secret value, can it, can we take a look at what values are available there? 
Sure. Thing. So okay, yeah. so it's not just the secret that we're providing. We are kind of treating it like we do our credential providers, where we're returning an object of key values more so than just the secret itself. That's right. Yeah. So if you want to pick up some specific bits of information, you could definitely you know have that in there. I don't have a ton of uh, file categories on this particular object, uh, but it should take. I think this is all of them. So I think it will take all of them that are on that particular object. So, so yeah, it's just like, it's, it's the same logic that, that we expect and know from the credential providers from the CCP. Um, and then we can pick and choose what we actually need from there. So that's really cool. Uh, we did get a question, um, on this from a LinkedIn user who I guess is anonymous. Didn't, didn't want to log into LinkedIn, but definitely wanted to, to watch our live event here. Um, is, is there a like-minded approach for onboarding via Terraform, which, I only really use Terraform for uh, deploying infrastructure into you know cloud service providers. I've never done any sort of like account onboarding or anything like that. Have you ever done anything like that with Terraform or gotten crazy like that in the POC? I have. I have actually done oh, that wow. with Terraform, and it's it's the people that want to choose. Let's say you have a defined secrets criteria right every team's got four and they put this in there right you can use terraform to build out that lattice work that framework to make sure all that's there this doesn't have a problem with that okay so if you want to use terraform to create the secrets and then have uh secret sub sort of take over you can definitely do that if you wanted to do so you could also have terraform interact directly with the cyborg vault to create um you know, secrets if you wanted to do that and then have Secrets Hub synchronize it over. There's a lot of different ways you can deal with this. You know, I had a couple uh, people ask, well, what about like replication? Should I set up, um, should I set up AWS replication between different regions and then have that do it or should I have Secret Hub do it? Right. Up to you, right? It really depends on what you would like to have happen, right? What the, what are the latencies involved? What are you trying to accomplish? So we yeah. can do a lot of this with, um, with Terraform. So you're pretty familiar with Terraform, right? So if I, I, one of the use cases that I like to show uh, when I am demonstrating Secrets Hub is I, my, I really feel that the biggest benefit here from Secrets Hub is the fact that now we can start to provide secrets from the CyberArk Vault, which is considered or should be considered our source of truth when it comes to all privilege and privileged access, whether it's identities, whatever. So we keep that the same, but we kind of hit roadblocks when we're working with AWS um, as a third party, right? So uh, right. trying to deal with providing secrets to CloudFormation as part of these templates that may need authentication, AWS doesn't expose an API that allows any third party to be able to do that to CloudFormation templates. So what ends up happening is that there is a form that needs to be filled out by whoever's triggering the CloudFormation template in order to provide that uh, initial password um, for whatever it resource that CloudFormation is going to end up automating the creation of. And the example that I like to get is a, a database in RDS, you know, a MySQL database in RDS. When you create that database, you need to provide an initial SA or root user that gets created at the same time that the database is deployed. What I've seen, I've seen two different cases uh, when I was researching this um, in the AWS community on how to handle this. Uh, from an unattended, you know, automation uh, trigger perspective, it's, hey, let's embed a standard password that we will just rotate as soon as the database is created um, and, and handle it that way. Kind of the old uh, uh, golden image, you know, laptop administrator ki kind of way of handling things. And then the second way would be an attended trigger of the cloud formation deployment where the, the user who is triggering it manually is able to provide a password to use for that initial user when it's set up. Um, what I did in my demonstration was I onboarded uh, first the account that I wanted to use as the SA or root account into CyberArk's vault. That allowed me to use the generate password uh, and, and password policy in CyberArk to 
keep that away from me, right? Like, I don't want to know what the password is. It's in CyberArk. And then synchronize that through Secrets Hub to Secrets Manager. Once we get it in Secrets Manager, now natively AWS does allow Secrets Manager to provide secrets to CloudFormation, at which point now we don't need to ask somebody for the password and hope they don't write it down somewhere or they don't use a common password or we have it hard coded into our cloud formation templates. It's already being managed by CyberArk. CyberArk's just waiting for the address so that it knows where to connect and verify and start managing that account in the database once it's deployed by cloud formation. So we're kind of solving the problem before it yeah. even starts and never really unveiling what that password is. Um, so that's that's kind of like a good use case that I know no one else can solve except for us unless you're using the AWS Secrets Manager natively um, because AWS, I'm sure, has something similar to our shared services backend where all their services are just hooked in together to, to Secrets Manager for that. Right, exactly. So it's one of the benefits of a shared service platform underpinning everything, being able to pass that information back and forth. But you're absolutely correct, right? It, a lot of these tools just open up new options mm -hmm. for you to try to get around some of those those limitations you run into, right? Like we yeah. discussed, you know, replication for the the different regions. Well, now you have an option, right? Yep. Instead of only using that, maybe maybe you don't want to turn that on. Maybe you just want to have it go directly from Secrets Hub. We're, we're just giving you a lot more options to solve those problems. Yeah. So we're we're. We've, we're an hour into this now, and this is usually the point where I pivot into answering questions from our chat. So uh, I have been posting this banner here to ask your questions in chat uh, because we'll be answering soon. We're going to start rolling through and answering some of them now. So for some reason, a lot of people like to wait until I say this to start asking their questions in chat, even though I've been blasting it uh, sooner. Um, we do have a couple uh, questions already in chat, uh, kind of you know related to to what we've been talking about already that I can put up there and we can kind of discuss. One of them goes back to Condra Cloud and and what we were talking about uh, there before, and that is uh, how Conjure SaaS handles the Vault Conjure uh, the Vault Synchronizer functionality. Um, and and we touched on this earlier, and maybe you know Acer had missed when we were talking about this, but um, you know, we just can into a little bit more detail, sure, right? Yeah. So as I mentioned, there's this new service. It's not just the synchronizer running in some EC2 instance uh, mm -hmm. in our tenant, right? It would, although we probably could have done that. Um, no, we decided to say, hey, we got some feedback about the synchronizer, specifically about the the time interval involved, right? So we initially thought that. Hey, let's make this um, something that's user definable because our, our the thought process was secrets don't change all the time, right? Very rarely do you come across someone changing things on a minute scale. It's more like oh, every 30 days, every 60 days, something like that. So we thought the synchronizer would be good for these sorts of environments. Remember, the synchronizer is five years old at this point. I think I think it's five years old. It wasn't available in the very beginning, but then it was the very next thing added. So it's it's... It may not seem like a long time to anyone who's in like the, the Windows uh, administration world, but as far as DevOps is concerned, that is a long time for something to be uh, out there. And it hasn't really, um, that fundamental concept hasn't changed, but we know that the environments in which they're being used have changed now. Minutes matter for a lot of this stuff. So we took that and said, let's create this thing called the replicator. I really wish they would let me name something, but they don't, so don't. <laughs> I can't control that. Someone thought replicator was a good word. So they went with what replicator. Would you call it? What would you call it? I don't even call it anything. I just call it, you know, magic. Synchronizer. Magic. Wand. Yeah. It, it's, call it one. You got to pay us for that magic sauce that's out there. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm really bad at naming. So pro I'd probably come up with replicator all on my own yeah. and, and have no one to blame but myself. <laughs> the years of having to name like demo assets and, and webinar assets have just drained all creativity for me altogether. First, they would, they'd would be like themes of planets or something or or Greek uh, mythology or, or whatever. Now it's just like demo one, demo two. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's all been sapped. Well, so we have I'll, this replicator. Well, I, I will say though, but you know, I, I don't know if it's, uh, if, if it's here 
you did have a pretty cool instead of hybrid you called it cybrid and i thought that that was a pretty cool play on cyber arc and hybrid um it was oh yeah Sub. yeah uh, i take no responsibility for that one whatsoever <laughs> okay <laughs> well i thought it was cool i noticed yeah it. um so replicator it's there now the one one downside to the synchronizer was that it wasn't that aware of what was going on in the vault at any given point in time, right? There's tons of flags. If you looked into the, the underpinnings of like what happens during a, a rotation event, right? There's tons of things that are going on at the platform level that is used by other components that you don't necessarily see as a user. You just know it changed and it got verified. So we're all good, but their flags are being set. There's change times being set, you know, so that, Mm -hmm. And then that's being distributed so other components know about these things. So the replicator is now tied into all of that. So instead of just having to wait on a polling cycle, it's going to proactively know, hey, wait a minute, that thing's going to change in 10, 15 minutes, two days, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, It's going to do that. I'm going to set myself a reminder to double check when that time comes so that I can pick up that latest and greatest at the time. Is it instantaneously? No, there's still some back and forth that are going on there. But, um, you know, we'll take a look at how long one of those synchronizer sessions uh, takes to get from one place to the other. And we can look at that actually really simply. Uh, let me share this tab. So we're going to pick a pick an account. I go to Classic UI. It's where I started. It's the thing I go to all the time. It's my go-to hey, happy place. Look, right? look, look, look. We... <laughs> We don't call it the classic UI. We call it the power user UI. Right? Power user UI. Power right? user. Yeah, exactly. It's not this classic. Is, this is... It's not legacy. We still need it. It's the power user UI, though. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, let me find one. <laughs> uh, I don't say it's secure. So any one of these. Let's go with SA. This is all dummy information. Uh, did I pick the one that doesn't have any activity on it? I did. I did pick the one that doesn't have any activity on it. Let's go with... Secure, secure. Secure, secure. I did it twice. Secure. There we go. Good redundancy. Oh, it's got to have the redundancy. So what are we what are we looking for here? Some activity. So basically, oh. yeah. So basically we're gonna see. Let's go back to the other view. I didn't we're even gonna know that see... was an option in the sidebar to go directly to the classic UI like that. I I, I wish we wouldn't call it that, but uh <laughs> <laughs> it's called the, the power users UI. Yeah. So basically what I want to show is the, the key point, the, the key feedback we got from the synchronizer was time. How long does it take for something to get from somewhere? All mm -hmm. right. So here's what I can show with uh, some of these things. Uh, did I pick one only with secrets hub? This is SA, root, ConjureSync. That's the one we're looking for. Mm -hmm. So this is the event where ConjureSync will pick up. Oh, there's something that occurred on this uh this um, this account and it'll pick that up. And this is constantly running uh, in the background so that we'll know when some sync has occurred, right? So ContraSync, this is a good mm -hmm. one. So I stored a password on 2.15, um, uh, at 2.15, 47 p.m. Secrets Hub picked it up at 2.16. Oh, wow. So we're at 14 seconds after, and wow. then right after that, ContraSync picked it up, right? Wow. So you're looking at less than a minute synchronization time for those things. And it would have been quicker had I not been trying to do multiple things on the same secret with having Secrets Hub uh, run there first, right? So these yeah. things are constantly running. So there's no five-minute interval. There's no interval you have to set. We'll know and go pick that up. And okay. that's for times to go directly from the, uh, the Privileged Cloud Vault all the way to, uh, in this case, Conjure. That's when it right. has been valid to get there. Yeah, so... So uh, no synchronizer, right? No service needed to be hosted using shared services backend. We call it a replicator now when we're talking about Conjure Cloud or, or SaaS. And uh, wow, like uh, we're seeing less than a minute here. I, I, yeah. I think even PM uh, has said up to a minute. So it could take up to a minute for it to happen. And I think that that's just them being, you know, extremely cautious. Overly cautious. Yeah. Yes. I've because never honestly, seen it come anywhere like, close to it. Uh, I, I haven't, I haven't done much with Conjure Cloud. I think you're, you're kind of the goat when it comes to Conjure Cloud. I've been more focused on Secrets Hub and had a lot of activity around that. And I have yet to onboard an account as part of a demonstration into Privilege Cloud and then log in and make it to AWS Secrets Manager and not see the account there. 
So yep. this is happening like really, really quick, which is awesome too. If you think about what we're trying to bring agility to uh, from you know microservices that need to commit a transaction and only live for milliseconds, not even a full second, right? And they need to have things available near on demand, right? Near real time. Yeah. And we don't want to increase that latency of their lifetime uh, by much, if at all. Yeah, exactly. One thing I also want, also wanted to point out from the synchronizer perspective, uh, we had this concept of line of business user. Now, this is another thing that we've learned from feedback that mm -hmm. wasn't so beneficial or helpful, right? Mm -hmm. to, to people out there. I don't think I've ever run to anyone using more than one line of business user. It was thought of, <laughs> oh, oh, there you go, <laughs> as a way of, of adding extra categorization. Right, right. that's what I use to, it for. That's what exactly, I use Exactly, right? And what we found is that not a lot of people used it, right? They just went yeah. back down to the safe level. So we got rid of that whole thing. So the way that you create a safe and add it to Conjure Cloud, you just add the Conjure Sync user. You don't have to worry about line of business users anymore. It's not going to be in the object path like it was before. It's just Conjure Sync. And that means everything is going to go over to uh, Conjure Cloud. Cool. Awesome. Hopefully, yeah, great question. That answers your question there. That was a very thorough walkthrough. And uh, hopefully everyone's a little bit more understanding of the differences between self-hosted and Conjure Cloud. Although uh, <laughs> we do have a question from anonymous LinkedIn user. If the replicator will be available for, for like a self-hosted Conjure uh, deployment, which is no. There, Conjure Cloud uh, will not ever integrate with self-hosted um, or, or sorry, sorry, sorry. The replicator that Darren has been talking about for Privilege Cloud and Conjure Cloud is because of the shared services backend that is SaaS based. It is not something that we can duplicate in a customer's environment where we need to provide synchronization between Privilege Cloud and self hosted Conjure on premise. So, uh, that will always remain the Vault Conjurer synchronizer, uh, and and it's not like we're we're focusing on the replicator and shared services and not focusing on the Vault Conjurer synchronizer service for on-prem. We have a lot of roadmap features that are coming to the Vault Conjurer synchronizer uh, this year, and I, I'm not going to yeah. give you any dates, but things like high availability are being discussed internally, which is a huge huge uh deliverable um when it will come you know what that will look like i don't know i just know that it's a priority <laughs> uh that we want to get done uh and that development of the vault conjure synchronizer hasn't ceased in in order exactly. to prioritize these teams the development the r d team that is assigned to self-hosted conjure is completely separate from the r d team that is focused on conjure cloud they are separate teams. So we're not taking resources away from one and focusing on another and trying to push everybody one way or another. We have different teams working in parallel on features for both. Some will definitely be easier to implement in SaaS because we control that infrastructure and we can get uh, some feedback a lot quicker from our cloud-based, you know, SaaS-based customers to then be able to provide a little bit more polished into the self-hosted, you know, Conjure Secrets Manager solution that you use. So maybe things will be introduced in that manner. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not, it, you know, it, 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 we're, we're shooting for keeping the experience uh, as close as possible to the same um, for both. And, and, Honestly, you know, it, it basically boils down to, and, and Darren, you know, cor correct me if, if I'm wrong or you disagree with me or something. It, it basically boils down to, are you comfortable enough with utilizing Privilege Cloud for your human, you know, identities? Yes. Well, Conjure Cloud is a no-brainer then, you know, have, have that uh, shared services backend that is connecting everything and utilize that to your benefit. Uh, if you are a financial and you have, you know, issues with Privilege Cloud and you want that self-hosted PAM uh, solution, then that's fine too. Use self-hosted Conjure and, and they'll both, 
utilize the same integrations, the same ways of delivering secrets to applications. Nothing's changing here except for where the infrastructure is being hosted and how crazy and cool we can get with uh, the, 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 the synchronization and the sharing of services because either we own the back end or you do, and we can't really be that cool with it. So, Yeah, I echo everything you just said, right? And it's we do get that a lot. Is Conjure Cloud replacing Conjure on-prem? Is, is Conjure replacing CP? No, these are no. options. These are other, you know, because not everyone's scenario is exactly the same. You mentioned the financials. Yeah. Different set of use cases. We want to provide them options so that meet their needs so that it's not deprecating one or the other. That's for sure. Right. Uh, so we, we do have uh, a, another question here, and, and I'm, I'm glad we're getting a lot of these questions now where, where Darren's on the call and I can start pivoting to him because uh, <laughs> sometimes it's just me and, and someone without Conjure knowledge and we get a lot of Conjure or credential provider questions and I end up you know needing to answer them all solo, but it's cool to be able to collaborate on these. Is there any way to have the vault synchronizer on a Linux or Unix system or running in a Docker image? Um, I mean, that's not really up to you and I, you know, I, right. I think that if well, we I could tell you, I could tell you the, the you can't, you cannot get the vault synchronizer running on a Linux or Unix system uh, because it's built off .NET. I could just, right. there's nothing, nothing we could do about that one. Uh, running as a Docker image is, uh, you we can well it could be a docker image, but it's a windows docker image yeah. right so yeah. the things that very few Which people run no not, right, not exactly it, and if as i know the, the <laughs> yeah, and the only way you can run a windows docker image is on windows machine so you kind of like have you done anything there really uh so yeah. technically possible but otherwise right now it is only uh, available on Windows. Yeah, I mean, it's the same reason that the CPM can't be on Linux or Unix or the PVWA can't be on Linux or Unix. It's because of the libraries that those solutions use in order to communicate in a secure fashion directly to the vault and be able to handle the vault's protocols. All of that is the same way that the synchronizer service was developed to deal with the synchronization between vault and conjure. If it was up to Conjure, of course, it would be able to live in Linux because we're just using Conjure's REST API at the end of the day for that communication. But when it comes to the vault, we have to be very, very careful with the way that we handle the communication there because uh, there are there is a lot more stored there, not only from a secrets perspective, but all of your audit data, all of your PSM recordings, like all of this information is stored in that enterprise password vault. Uh, and And so we need to to follow best practices, right? Like, could we get away with using the REST API? Sure, we could. But why, when we have this awesome proprietary protocol with, you know, uh, levels of encryption in place that uh, I haven't seen anybody be able to break? I think, well, no, actually, one person was able to, and we hired him immediately, and that's Shy, and he leads up our red team. So... <laughs> you want to you want to crack it and get a job at CyberArk feel free but you're not going to be able to because of course what what shy utilized we immediately patched so <laughs> all bets are off there um so cool thank you eh uh, for that question um another question from scott c in youtube are there sync options for pam uh, self-hosted to priv cloud. This is a probably a great question for one of our solutions architects who are not on uh, with us this week. Um, but I think that uh, we can easily answer this as yeah. a, a, an emphatic no, no. Well, actually, so so sync. It depends on what you mean, right? So, so if I'm you mean as like a normal synchronization, but maybe. Maybe Scott, if you want in chat to define that as migration or something right. like that, maybe it'd be if a that's what you meant, then we do have some stuff, right? right? Even even I was in a, a meeting about it a week ago, two weeks ago. It very, seems very like simple. All you do now is just these meetings with Yes, that is that is all all that I do. Principal engineer just means welcome to principal. Yeah, <laughs> not engineer anymore, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm not sure. We'll figure it out. It, it seems to be a common theme if you if you search on Twitter or somewhere. Like, what does a principal engineer do? They're like, I don't, I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out. Uh, but yeah, if if sync means like you want to have a 
an on-prem vault and a privileged cloud vault at the same time and keep them lock and step, uh, that is not, I don't think that's something that uh, we've even thought about, honestly, because uh, I don't even know, I can't think of a scenario that would help you uh, for anything. I mean, the, the only scenario I can think of is like, hey, we're on premise now. We are doing a conversion to SaaS and we need to get our secrets from Pam self hosted or, or our accounts from Pam self hosted into privilege cloud. Um, but it seems like from Scott here, he kind of followed up with us. They're going to utilize it for ongoing for our high availability off site. So that's really cool. I wish never we once had, thought of that. I wish yeah. we had Joe Strickland on or, 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 or Adam. Uh, or, or one of our solution, Mark Herter, even one of our solutions architects to, to be able to talk to this because, I mean, that is a br pretty brilliant idea there, Scott. Um, I never thought of that. And now I have so many things going off in my head. Right <laughs> so now. many other questions to follow up with. What, wait, right. let's t what if, what if somebody wanted to do that with Conjure? Like what's stopping somebody from wanting to have Conjure Cloud as a, well, it, uh, yeah, Conjure Cloud as a, a, a like a like a hot uh, a, a hot DR you know kind of scenario where it's there, uh, it's replicating. Um, it can be failed over to if the self hosted Conjure Secrets Manager cluster you know fails for whatever reason, because self hosted Conjure and the Vault Conjure Synchronizer service can synchronize secrets from Privilege Cloud, and then. You also have Conjure Cloud, which is using the shared services to replicate there. There's really nothing stopping somebody from having that sort of scenario. I just don't understand why you would go with Conjure Cloud and then not use it. You know, like that's that's my thing. I would imagine it would be the side. other way around, right? So it'd be like our primary is the cloud versions, wow. and then a backup would be, you know, like some lot of cold spare yeah. in the data center somewhere. Right. Like my DR right. data center is it will fail over, like everything will fail over to this DR if the cloud goes down. And since yeah. we're cloud, like maybe we need to click over to something local. But then that's why we have, and we didn't discuss this at all, but we have Conjure Edge coming down the pipeline where instead of you know having followers be read-only replicas, we now have these edge nodes that we can deploy that will basically replicate similar to our credential providers, but from Conjure Cloud instead for that local presence. So I think Conjure and the way it's delivered as a cluster, it's an easy solution to just use one of those nodes. And then right. eventually it'll connect back to a leader because we have more of a cluster set up there. But you know, going this route for... Um, for self-hosted PAM is is interesting. Uh, I've seen people do like uh, like high availability clusters before, not with Privilege Cloud in the mix though. Um, I've seen satellite vaults be utilized uh, somewhat in this way, um, but I you know that would be so cool. It would be, it'd like, be easy, uh, right? You won't have to set up the like, HA infrastructure. We have, just like, we have yeah. the concept of satellite vaults with the PAM side of the house anyways. What if Privilege Cloud could be configured as a satellite vault against an on-premise primary vault? I wonder yeah. if anybody's ever tested that before. I would say, Scott, the, the thing to do is, is to take that idea and just hit up your AE. Like we're going to ask the our solutions architects, the ones that Joe just mentioned, like immediately after this, like, hey, what about this? What are your thoughts? But I definitely want to close the loop uh, on that because they they probably got some idea about why or why not, uh, yeah. or or maybe they never even thought about it. And you'll be the, the first one to give us the idea. I mean, I, you know, just understanding the back end of, of what we do for Privilege Cloud I think it's worth some internal research. I, I definitely wouldn't want to do that with a customer to begin with. <laughs> but I think that it's that's a very cool idea, Scott. I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, on the next office hours that we do, I will have a solutions architect with me. So, you know, uh, maybe we can noodle on it uh, in that next office hours. Uh, but if it's something that you need to, to, to be answered, you know, sooner rather than later, definitely reach out to your account executive and they'll be able to pull in the solutions architect privately uh, to, to take care of it now.
Um, Jack in YouTube uh, chatted with us and uh, missed a comment about LOB users. They're actually trying to roll it out now, but they're using it to synchronize multiple Conjure clusters to a single vault. I feel like in this scenario, that actually makes sense, having an LOB per Conjure cluster, right? And, and Jack, I assume that's why you're using multiple LOB users here. So you have cluster one, cluster two, cluster three with its own line of business. But I don't know that it's the, necessary, the though, case. either, uh, because, well, I, yeah, I it don't could know. be. It could be. So it depends on why you have multiple clusters. Like I have um, a couple clients that do use multiple clusters, but they're not for mm -hmm. reasons, not for like performance reasons or this or like GDPR or yeah. data segregation rules. And and what you find or what these clients found is that they have the same naming schemes within each of the um, vaults. Hmm. So having a line of business users is actually really beneficial in that case because otherwise you'd have exactly the same path and Conjure would know what to do with that, right? Uh, and you would know which place it came from and which one's going because this is a one-to-many uh, synchronization. Yeah. So it's good to have that level of, of um, line of business user if that's your specific scenario. Do you, do you encounter a lot of our customers going with multiple Conjure clusters like Jack was talking about they're dealing with right now? Or do you typically see... Uh, more commonly, uh, just like single clusters being deployed and distributed globally. How how do, how do you see that approached? So I normally do not see a split like that, right? Because mm -hmm. what boils down to is if they have a single vault, then what's the need for multiple Conjure clusters and not multiple Conjure vaults, right? That's normally what happens. I'm right. sure there are use cases all over the place for different things. Uh, but that, we normally see that lock and step of, if you have a single vault, you probably have a single contract cluster. Yeah. If you have multiple vaults, you probably don't want to combine all those for whatever reason because you have multiple vaults anyway, unless there's some underlying reason. I can think of a few clients, there's underlying reasons. They're like, we want one vault, but for X, Y, Z, we can't, right? So maybe yeah. they're, that's that's part of the reasoning here. Yeah, I see it. I, I see the multiple clusters uh, route taken a lot personally and 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 it's i but i cover the fed region right for 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 america so there's a lot of top secret environments and things like that that are air gapped from other environments but but they still need secrets in those environments um and so i'll i'll see multi multiple cloud scenarios where uh you know i have not seen a multiple vault environment surprisingly enough where there's vaults in each of these air gap networks um but having a standalone conjure instance in them to deal with secrets and stuff like that are conversations I've had before. But again, because they're air gapped environments, there's no vault there. I'm not having to deal in, with, you know, a synchronizer service even existing uh, or having the conversation around lines of business. Honestly, you know, thinking back on it now, I don't think I've ever really had to, in, in, in the pre-sales process at least, have any real conversations around lines of business. It's just basically accepted that I have a vault, it will synchronize to Conjure, and, and that's the end of the day. Like, I don't get yeah. into explaining lines of business at all unless, you know, I guess in the case of Jack, I would have basically, you yeah. know, because you have to at that point, right? That's getting more into not necessarily what is the, the solution doing for you is how can I utilize the solution? Like what are the things I can manipulate to, to accomplish my goal? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're an hour and a half into this amazing, amazing office hours. I'm so happy. First one of the year. I was glad to have you here. Uh, oh, not many coming in through chat right now. I did have this scheduled until 3 PM, uh, I had a hard stop at 3 p.m. Sometimes we can go over by like 15, 20 minutes after 3 p.m. And sometimes we just don't get a lot of questions, which is fine too. Uh, being on a Friday, it's a little bit uh, a little bit different than you know me trying to do it on Thursday afternoons and things like that. So um, a lot of people, I'm sure, will watch this on demand and will have questions. If you need uh, to get your question answered, definitely you know, reach out to your account executive and, and we can get questions answered now. If you're looking to share it on an office hours or join the next office hours, the next one that I will be scheduling will be in two weeks. 
Uh, we'll be covering. We'll we'll have uh, we'll have an identity subject matter expert, the the principal, newly promoted Ooh. principal Ooh. Yeah. solutions engineer <laughs> for identity. Uh, uh, Jared will be here. Um, and he'll be going over some of the new stuff that was announced at Impact last year when it comes to identity, our uh, compliance piece, uh, uh, identity flows, which is a really cool low-code, no-code automated workflow system, uh, tying identity into all, so all sorts of other third-party things like O365 and the like. Uh, so get your questions ready for that. Uh, any skim questions, right? Identity, IGA type stuff. All of this, uh, MFA, SSO, workforce, uh, all, all of these um, types of questions. Get them ready. You've got two weeks to prepare. Uh, we'll come back. We'll take a look at some of that stuff. We'll have a Q&A with him. Darren, I definitely appreciate you joining today and, and finally taking some time out. It's been it's it's been a year coming honestly i've been trying to get <laughs> you on here and uh, no thank you for the invite i really appreciate it. this was a lot of fun yeah so hopefully you know we'll get you back here a little bit closer to mid year so that we can talk a little bit more about uh maybe maybe recap uh you know what has been you know brought uh, to us by secrets hub and conjure cloud where we're at with those sorts of things hopefully by then we'll be able to take a a a first look at uh, conjure edge for Conjure Cloud. I'm really excited about the development around that. Uh, just the fact that they're building it in Go, I think just gave me goosebumps <laughs> and, and, of and course, yeah. really fall in love. But uh, we'll take a look at that. Maybe we'll have some Azure Key Vault integration to show off with Secrets Hub. You never know. Um, but until then, definitely appreciate it again. Coming by everybody in chat that came by, asked a question. Anybody watching on demand on YouTube, thank you for hanging out. And uh, we'll 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 see you soon. And until then, Darren, chat, right. everyone, stay secure. <laughs>